Trustee and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, who just introduced himself and is talking about himself in the third person. My views and opinions do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. Actually, five are brand... Excuse me, four are brand new. One is, it's been out for a while, but it's one of those films that I have yet to review on this show, and I will today. First, though, I'm going to get into my segment, What's Topping the Box Office? This is a rundown of the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits, some of them are flops, but I'll tell you exactly the difference. Number one of the box office this week is not too much of a surprise. It is Rampage, starring Dwayne Johnson. Now, this might be number one one next week, but rest assured, when Avengers Infinity War comes out in two weekends, this movie will not be number one, although we'll probably see it in the top ten for quite some time, probably at least in the next four weeks. But this weekend, it made $35.8 million at the U.S. box office against a budget of $120 million, so it still has a long way to go to recoup its budget here in the States. However, around the world, on a $120 million budget, it has so far grossed $151.5 million. So while it's not a hit yet here at the U.S. box office, around the world it is already a tentative hit. A Quiet Place was number one at the box office last week. This week it fell to number two, having grossed just $33 million. But it does say something where it just grossed about $2.5 million less than Rampage. Just that much in the second week, that's very impressive. But against a budget of $17 million, that's $17 million, A Quiet Place is so far grossed. $100 million at the U.S. box office and $151.7 million. So, A Quiet Place in just two weeks is a certified hit here in the States and around the world with a bullet. So, very good for that movie. And it deserves it because it was one of the higher quality horror movies that have come out so far this year in 2018. Another horror movie which I'm going to refrain from telling you what I thought about it until I get to my review, is number three at the box office this weekend, Truth or Dare, making its debut this weekend. It made $18.7 million at the U.S. box office this weekend and $21.3 million around the world, but that's on a budget that's even smaller than A Quiet Place. A Quiet Place's budget, again, is $17 million. Truth or Dare's budget is $3.5 million. So it's kind of astonishing, but Truth or Dare is a certified hit here in the States and around the world already. Ready Player One is a movie that I expected to do better at the box office in you know the, the time it's been here. It was number one for one week. I ex- actually expected it to be number one for much longer. It's certainly a film that deserves it. But this week it's number four, dropping from number two last week, having grossed $11.5 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $175 million, Ready Player One has so far grossed $114.9 million here in the States and... $475.1 million worldwide. So it has yet to recoup its budget here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. So the rest of the world kind of knows something that the U.S. doesn't seem to know. It's, that's unfortunate. Blockers is number five at the box office this weekend, falling from number three last week. This weekend it grossed $10.8 million. Against a budget of $21 million, Blockers has so far grossed $37.4 million here in the States and $52.9 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. Black Panther, I'm just going to tell you, it was number four last week, it was number six this week. It's a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Here's by how much. This weekend it only made $5.8 million, but against a budget of $200 million, Black Panther has so far made $674.2 million here in the States in its ninth week in release. That's astonishing that it's still in the top ten after nine weeks. But around the world it has so far made $1.31 billion 
dollars. And I would not be surprised if Avengers Infinity War beat that record, but Black Panther has a tight grip on that amount of money, and it's only slightly less than Star Wars The Force Awakens made back in 2015. But very good for Black Panther, and it certainly deserves it. (coughs) Excuse me. Isle of Dogs, which I'll tell you, I reviewed this movie a couple of weeks ago, and this is a movie that I was really surprised wasn't in the top 10 when I first reviewed it, but it has since gone into nationwide expansion, and therefore more theaters, and is number 7 at the box office, actually climbing from number 10 last week. This weekend it made $5.5 million. Against an undisclosed budget, Isle of Dogs has so far made $18.9 million here in the States and $27.8 million worldwide. I can't tell you whether this movie is a hit or not because I don't know the budget, but it's climbing at the U.S. box office, so that's off to a really good start. I Can Only Imagine is number 8 at the box office this weekend, sliding from number 6 last week. I Can Only Imagine has made $4.1 million at the box office this week. Against a budget of $7 million, I Can Only Imagine has so far grossed $75.3 million, which is very impressive. That makes it a certified hit here in the States, and while I don't have the international numbers for you, because it is a certified hit here in the States, it is vicariously a certified hit around the world. Acrimony, the Tyler Perry movie, is number 9 at the box office this weekend, sliding from number 5 last week. Acrimony has so far made, three, or rather, this weekend it made $3.7 million. Against a budget of $20 million, Acrimony has so far made $37.8 million here in the States and $38.9 million worldwide, which means in every other country besides the United States, Acrimony has only pulled in $1.1 million. Still, it's a tentative hit here in the States and around the world, very close to being a certified hit. And finally, Chappaquiddick is number 10 of the box office this weekend, sliding from number 7 last week. Chappaquiddick made $3.1 million this past weekend, and I don't have the information for you on how much Chappaquiddick cost to make, but it's so far made $11 million at the U.S. box office so far. And I also don't have any international information for you. I don't know how this movie did around the world, and because I don't know its budget, I also can't tell you what kind of movie it is, whether it's a hit or a flop, but I'm guessing it still has a ways to go to recoup its budget, whatever that is. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Your favorite Boston Free Radio artists will be taking over the airwaves to bring you new and original content. Don't hold your tongue. An SMC Speak Out, Sunday, June 10th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. 12 straight hours of live performances, comedy, music, visual art, and more. Find out more and donate now online at somervillemedia.org. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder that you are listening to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. You are watching Words on Film on Somerville Community Access Television or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching me on Facebook Live on my own personal page because our tablet here is not making it possible for me to simulcast on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. But either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is another video game movie, this time with Dwayne Johnson starring in it. It is Rampage, and this is a movie that's based on a very fun arcade game that came out in the mid-80s, 1986 to be exact, and being a child of the 80s. I I shouldn't say a child of the 80s because I didn't really come of age in the 80s. I think that was more 90s for me. But the the 80s ended when I was 7. But in any event, whether it was the 80s or, or the 90s, I do remember 
going to the arcade and losing so many quarters on this game Rampage, but it was a lot of fun. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Rampage video game, the movie is loosely based on the video game. When three different animals, an albino, gorilla, an alligator, and a giant wolf become infected with a dangerous pathogen, a primologist, Dwayne Johnson, and a genesist, excuse me, geneticist, team up to stop them from destroying Chicago. So that's basically the plot. I don't think there's very much more to tell you about that. The primatologist, of course, is Dwayne Johnson, as I mentioned. His character's name is David Okoye, and he is somebody who is... Kind of like Jane Goodall in the sense that he is able to communicate very well with primates, especially primates who know sign language, like the real-life Coco the Chimp did. I'm not sure if... Back when Coco was a was a big phenomenon, that was in the 70s and the 80s, I think Coco was the very first recorded primate who could communicate with humans via sign language. So I'm guessing that more primates have been conditioned to communicate with sign language, but I'm not sure if that's common or if it's it's still rare. But I do know back when it was Coco, Coco was amongst the only ones. But Again, don't quote me on that. But the geneticist in this movie is Dr. Kate Caldwell, who's played by a great actress, Naomi Harris, who is American in this film, but she's actually British, probably best known for her role in 28 Days Later, although she had a great supporting performance in Moonlight, for which she was nominated for an Oscar. She unfortunately didn't win, but either way, uh, Naomi Harris and Dwayne Johnson, even though they don't make a budding romance in this movie, or at least not for this movie, maybe for the sequel, but they work very well together in this film. In fact, there are a number of high-profile actors in this film, and by high-profile, I mean very good actors who also play good supporting roles. There's a great role in this movie from Jeffrey Dean Morgan, best known for playing the Walking Dead villain Negan, who, being a Walking Dead fan, I hate Negan so much, but that's just a testament to how good an actor Jeffrey Dean Morgan is. He plays a government agent by the name of Harvey Russell. And he's one of those government agents who doesn't work for the FBI or the CIA. He works for a government agent who is an agency who is so secretive that as these movies go, you don't know, you, you've never heard of the agency. They only come up out during very traumatic events like three giants. <laughs> Animals who are wrecking the the city of Chicago, like these animals in Rampage are. So the the dangerous pathogen came to these animals after falling from space. I'm not sure that was one of the big contrivances of this film because. Yes, it's a fun film, and yes, I enjoyed watching it, and I especially liked connecting it to the video game, but why would people test pathogens in outer space, especially if they're dangerous? There's there's a scene in the beginning where an astronaut played by Marley Shelton is who's who basically is is in the movie so briefly it's practically a cameo is trying to get out of her space pod or rather into a space pod and out of the International Space Station because she tried the pathogen on a rat and the rat turned big and dangerous. So again, if there are only a couple of people in space trying out a pathogen that could enlarge the size of animals, why are they doing it in space? Why is there only a couple of them? Wouldn't it be more cost efficient to be in a lab and and deal with the problems there with a whole team of scientists? But in any event, when the space station explodes, and I'm not sure if it's actually the International Space Station. I doubt it, but it's a space station in this movie. But the space station explodes and the pathogens go from the space station onto Earth, somehow making it past the Earth's orbit, and they go to various places, surprisingly enough, all in the United States. They land in one place in Wyoming where a wolf is exposed to the pathogen. They land in the San Diego Wildlife Sanctuary where the albino albino gorilla who's being trained by Dwayne Johnson is, and they also land in Florida where a giant alligator is. So eventually, 
the company that is responsible for creating these pathogens have a plan to bring these three creatures to Chicago by way of this giant satellite or some edifice on their giant building, which will lead them to the building in Chicago, and then they'd be able to kill the animals and, I guess, use part of their DNA for more scientific experiments. The... the there are quite a few contrivances in this film and, and parts where you definitely suspend disbelief. But with that said, I did think the human actors, including Dwayne Johnson, made up for what the, the story lacked in, in I guess, scientific relevant, relevance. But if you're not looking for a, a movie that will explain to you everything scientific happening in this movie. And if you think about it, you're going to have a lot of doubts. I, I think you might not get a lot out of Rampage, but I did think it was a fun movie. It did make me harken back to the video game, um, which I had fun playing as a kid. And it gets my rating of a checkout because it was a fun film to watch, if not the best in scientific accuracy. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. <sighs> Okay, I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay, I just pop some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Greetings and welcome to the beautiful me club. Save the date, Saturday, September 29th, for the fourth annual Evolution of Hip Hop Festival. Hi, I am Yvette, and I am the creative director for the Hip Hop Festival. Please join the Somerville Arts Council, Somerville Media Center, the Somerville Line, What's the Word Radio, to celebrate this wonderful event. Saturday, September 29th, 2018, from 3 to 7 p.m. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Truth or Dare. This is a movie where a bunch of college kids play a harmless game of Truth or Dare that, as you might expect turns deadly. Now I had to emphasize when I was when I was giving my spoken word preview on the the last segment I sh- of my show that I usually do which is what's coming up next. I had to explain that this movie Truth or Dare is no relation to the Madonna documentary. But when I looked up Truth or Dare on Wikipedia and on IMDb when I when I was doing research for my show, I actually found out that there wasn't just the Madonna movie that was called Truth or Dare. There have been at least four films, four feature films, none of which were released in theaters, that were called Truth or Dare. And my guess is, judging from what I saw in this movie, Truth or Dare, which is technically called Bloomhouse's Truth or Dare, because Bloomhouse is the production company that created this movie and probably called itself Bloomhouse's Truth or Dare to distinguish itself from both the Madonna documentary and the other films of that same name. But either way, my guess is that those other films were just like this film, Truth or Dare. (laughs) You know, it was where these kids play the game of Truth or Dare, and then they find that it's more than just a game, and they find themselves playing it or else dying as a result of some spell being placed on them and some unknown paranormal entity that is blackmailing them into doing every dare or telling the absolute truth when, when they take truth or else they die. And that is exactly what happens with this movie. Truth or Dare is not a movie I hated, but rest assured, it's not scary. It's full of so many horror movie tropes and cliches. And there's really... And the way it ends, most especially, is just incredibly disappointing. It feels like the biggest cop-out. So if you want to see that film based on my synopsis of it right there, then I suggest you go ahead, but there's really nothing surprising about Truth or Dare. I suppose the actors in the film had a lot of potential. I especially like the girl in the movie, um, 
whose character's name is Olivia Barron, and she's played by a lovely young actress by the name of Lucy Hale. And Lucy Hale plays a girl who is not into the whole spring break thing, and she's actually, she's a college student, and she initially decides to volunteer with Habitat for Humanity in lieu of going to Mexico with her other hard-partying college uh, college cronies. But her girlfriend, or rather her um, best friend, who's a girl, Marky, who's played by Violet Bean, begs her to go to Mexico on spring break with them, and also phones Habitat for Humanity, like the good friend she is, and tells her that it tells them that her friend Olivia has shingles. So basically, Olivia is dragged kind of, but not really kicking and screaming to Mexico. And on the last day of spring break, as the the group of college cronies is having one last party and getting ready to leave, Lucy meets a, excuse me, Olivia, played by Lucy Hale, meets another guy who is, I guess, somewhat charming. And they, he takes Olivia as well as her college friends to some abandoned church on the border between Mexico and Texas and plays a game of truth or dare with them. And as it turns out, this guy, similar to other horror movies of late, especially like the far superior movie It Follows, tells them that he has passed on a curse to them, and they have to keep playing truth or dare. Otherwise, this paranormal entity will kill them if they if he dares them to do something, and he doesn't, and they don't do the dare, or th- he they ask for truth, and he asks them a question, and they say and they they lie about it or they refuse to answer. So you have to take every dare, you have to tell the truth every truth uh, every time you're told to tell the truth, and so forth. And you'd never see this paranormal entity. Instead, he embodies the minds and bodies of people who are around whose ever turn it is to play truth or dare. And the person whose spirit and body this entity inhabits gets this really creepy smile on their face as well as, as red eyes. And when I saw... Every time I saw this spirit take over somebody else's body, particularly their face, I immediately thought of music videos by Aphex Twin like Window Liquor. Although, rest assured, Aphex Twin, as talented a techno group as they are, have much scarier music videos, especially Window Liquor. And if you don't believe me, look that video up. It's directed by Chris Cunningham. Avex Twins music videos are far scarier than this movie. And truth basically because at least with Avex Twins music videos which were so creepy by the way that MTV back when they played music videos refused to air them. But in any event the difference between Aphex Twin and this movie is not only that they're a singing group and this is a feature film, but Aphex Twin is not afraid to take risks, whereas Truth or Dare, for a movie called Truth or Dare, dares very little. And unfortunately, while there were some fun moments, and I did like Lucy Hale in her... In her um, in her starring role debut here, I think she has far better movies on the horizon, but Truth or Dare is just not a particularly memorable film. It's not a film I've ha- I hate. I mean, there are certainly other films that try much harder to scare you and, and fail. In fact, the movie p- poster for Truth or Dare says, the producer of Happy Death Day and Get Out invites you to play truth or dare and when if it's if it was the director of get out or the writer of one of these movies that's that to me gets my attention a lot more than the producer because the producers produce a lot of different movies and just because a same producer is producing a great movie as a bad movie does not make that bad movie better and truth or dare is certainly in that ballpark Truth or Dare is a movie that gets my rating of a very low strikeout. The reason it's not a flunk out is because I thought the actors, especially Lucy Hale, tried the best they could, and they do have a bright future ahead of them. Dad? 
This is fun. I didn't think I liked kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. And I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage, and punk. Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Chappaquiddick, which is a fairly recent movie that was, according to IMDb, released in 2017, but here in the U.S. it got a 2018 release. I think that it was released into a lot of film festivals last year, like the Toronto Film Festival, before it received a nationwide release. And it does tell the story about Ted Kennedy's involvement in the fatal 1969 car accident that claimed the life of a young campaign strategist by the name of Mary Jo Kopechny. The young Ted Kennedy in this movie, who I guess is in his late 20s or early 30s, is played by Jason Clark, and Mary Jo Kopechny is played by Kate Mara. Both of them are very very good actors, and I think Jason Clark turns in his best performance in this film as Ted Kennedy. And the interesting thing about Jason Clark is that you would think from watching this film that Jason Clark maybe doesn't look exactly like Ted Kennedy, but he certainly looks like a Kennedy. But as it turns out, Jason Clark is an Australian actor, not an American or even an Irish American actor. I, I would think maybe he has Irish ancestry back there, or his acting is is that good. But while Jason Clark's acting is good in this movie, surprisingly, Chappaquiddick drags. I did think it was sort of on the right track when it came to not only showing the 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 car accident that resulted in Ted Kennedy, who was behind the wheel, actually driving off of a bridge, and he was, according to this film, driving drunk, but the the car actually flipped over, and Ted Kennedy himself was able to get out of alive, but he was not able to save Ms. Kopechny, despite his claims that he tried his best to save her and couldn't. But... Ted Kennedy makes a fatal mistake on the part of Ms. Kopechny in the sense that after he escapes from the car, he does not call the police. And there's a whole list of... There's a whole chain of events that leads up to this car ride. And... There is a bit of a flirtation in this film between Ted Kennedy and Mary Jo Kopechny. And it's not... At the time, this takes place in 1969, uh, the in September of 69, at the time, Ke Ted Kennedy was married with children. I don't know if he cheated on his wife the same way his older brother, John F. Kennedy, did his, but yeah, he, he probably had it on his mind. But this movie, I don't think, pulls any punches when it comes to showing exactly what happened at Chappaquiddick 
Massachusetts, which was where Ted Kennedy had a summer home, which he shares with a number of his friends and members of his family. One of his friends is Joseph Gargan, who's not only his friend, but also an attorney, played by Ed Helms. And he also has a co-attorney whose name is Markham. And he's only known as Markham on IMDb, so I'm not sure if this character is a composite character. He might be, but in any event, he's played by Jim Gaffigan. And you're used to seeing Ed Helms and Jim Gaffigan in a lot of comedies. This is one of the few dramas they're in. But they do a good job definitely not only giving legal advice to the young Senate whip. And at the time, Ted Kennedy was the youngest Senate whip in U.S. history. I'm not sure if that has been beaten. But in any event, in 1969, there were high hopes for the Kennedy family and a lot of other Democrats that very much like his older brothers, John and Bobby, that Ted Kennedy would run for president. And he did, but, well, it was probably because of this movie, or rather not because of this movie, but because of the incidents portrayed in this film, that he might not have done so. But with that said, it is amazing how he got away with what he did. Now, Ted Kennedy didn't intentionally murder Ms. Kopechny, but he was facing the very serious charge of involuntary manslaughter based on the fact that he was drinking when he was behind the wheel and he was driving recklessly. But it was because of his family connections and the people in law that he knew besides Joseph Gargan and Markham that he was actually able to be (laughs) acquitted of the charges. I don't want to say acquitted because I did think he, I think he took some responsibility for it, but he certainly did not act becoming of somebody who had political aspirations beyond the Senate. And Ted Kennedy certainly did have a rich career in the Senate until he died in 2015, but this is one of those incidents in his life from which he never recovered, both politically or in his reputation as an alcohol abuser. And he did seek some help later on, but Chappaquiddick, I think, does well when it comes to showing what happened in this this car accident. And I also really liked how it shows Ted Kennedy almost remaking the events in his head to make it seem that he was less responsible for this accident than he ultimately was. Of course, when you're in a panic and you do something bad, even by accident, you rework the the story in your head to make and paint a over all the ugly parts. And that was part of the 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 theme from uh, Akira Kurosawa's film Rashomon, how some people are able to maleate their memories based on how they're feeling in the in the given moments and maybe some other ways as well. But Rashomon dealt with a phenomenon of how four different people can reimagine the same event in different ways. Not because they're lying, but because memories are malleable and and your mind can play tricks on you. But here in Chappaquiddick, it's not so much about minds playing tricks on you as much as it is trying to justify exactly what happened and maybe take less culpability than you think you should. But with that said, Chappaquiddick did have some dragging moments, particularly when... Ted Kennedy, played by Jason Clark, is on trial for involuntary manslaughter. And I, I thought that part dragged quite a bit. But other than that, I thought Chappaquiddick was well acted. And it gets my rating of a checkout. And it, I was certainly very impressed by Jason Clark's performance. And Kate Mara, who's probably taking a little bit more backlash for her role in Fan Forstick than she should, is a really good actress. I think she's a better actress than her sister Rooney Mara. But that is, of course, just my opinion. But I also really liked the supporting performances by Ed Helms, Jib Gaffigan, and Bruce Dern. Why is the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling on it. The dad joke. <laughs> Corny, grown worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off for school? Bye, son. <laughs> so take a moment to make your kid laugh because dad jokes rule. 
Make your kid laugh today. Go to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Boston Free Radio, where the radio still rules. BostonFreeRadio.com. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blow. Neurotic tone. Intensify and groove me. This and more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Love, Simon. This is a movie that came out a month ago, but I didn't get to review it until this past weekend when I finally got the chance to see it. It's not in the top ten, but still for a teen comedy, particularly about a gay teen, this did incredibly well. It On a budget of $17 million, in the U.S. it grossed $39 million and counting because even though it's not in the top 10, it's still in several theaters. And I was really impressed by this film. Again, there are... There are moments where I see a gay-themed film and I can't relate to it because I'm not gay. But then again, there are really good movies about which center on uh, gay people, like, for instance, Brokeback Mountain or Moonlight are probably the best ones. And last year, or rather a couple of months ago, I did see Call Me By Your Name, and I wasn't as impressed by it as other audience goers or film critics, basically because I couldn't quite relate to the protagonist in that film. But with Love, Simon, I don't know what it is that separates this movie from... Call Me By Your Name. Maybe it's a different time period. I don't know. Maybe it's set in more contemporary America, whereas Call Me By Your Name takes place in Italy in 1983. But I could relate a lot more to Love, Simon, despite the fact that I'm a heterosexual man. But Love, Simon is based on a novel which came out a little while ago. The novel is called Simon vs. the Homo Sapien Agenda, which was actually, if you can believe it, written by a woman, Becky Albertalli. The uh, The screenplay was written by Elizabeth Berger and Isaac Aptaker and is directed by Greg Berlanti. And Greg Berlanti is a director who I can't quite look up right now because my... Internet's a little slow. Here we go. Greg Berlanti has produced a number of movies. He's only directed five movies, or rather four movies so far. One of the movies he directed was Life As We Know It, which which was a cheesy romantic comedy starring Josh Duhamel and... Catherine Heigl, which didn't do especially well. It might have done okay commercially, but it certainly didn't do very well critically. But in terms of gay-themed movies, I'm not sure if Greg Berlanti is actually gay, but he did direct an indie film back in 2000 called A Broken Hearts Club, which is a romantic comedy because it says in the title, the official title of the film is The Broken Hearts Club, A Romantic Comedy. So it is good to see Greg Berlanti go from doing a big-budget throwaway romantic comedy to doing a big-budget movie that has some romantic comedy elements to it, but certainly is a lot more in line with the Broken Hearts Club and tells a unique story about an underrepresented group of people. But the Simon in this movie is Simon Spire, who keeps a huge secret from his family, his friends, and all of his classmates. He's gay. When that secret is threatened, Simon must face everyone and come to terms with his identity. So that is the plot in a nutshell. Simon is played by a young actor by the name of Nick Robinson, who is an American actor from Seattle, Washington. He actually was in a film last year called Everything Everything. And while that movie wasn't the greatest, he was actually the romantic lead in that movie. And he played alongside... 
Amanda Stenberg, and both of them had incredible chemistry. Yeah, that's that's the plus I'll say about everything. Everything. It wasn't the the greatest film I'd ever seen, and it certainly had some inconsistencies. But the chemistry between Nick Robinson and uh, Amanda. Stenberg was certainly undeniable. But here in Love, Simon, I I think that Nick Robinson actually does one better than he did in Everything, Everything. I don't know whether he's gay in real life or not, but in this movie, he certainly plays someone who struggles with a big secret. And even uh, people who are in high school who are not closeted have some secret to hide and i th- i think that nick robinson does well even though we live in an age where it's not it's not popularity suicides to come out of the closet quite as much anymore but with that said high school is still a brutal place i should know because i've been there and it it also ostracizes people who are different in a lot of ways, or at least that's what I'm speculating. But in this age where gay people are now allowed to be married and being gay is not as much of a stigma as it used to be, there it still presents some problems. And I think this movie illustrates that very well. Um, Simon's parents in this movie are played by Jennifer Garner and Josh Duhamel, and they both are really good. I think Jennifer Garner plays the liberal mom and Josh Duhamel plays a multifaceted father who's not one of those men who would kick his child out of the house because he's he's different let alone gay. I I think they've I think it's great that that movie has moved beyond that cliche. And I'm not sure if it's the the movie that's moved beyond it or the book. But either way, I, I like that, that they they show that kind of, of dad who might not be completely open to the idea of th- their, his son being gay, but certainly is getting a little bit more adjusted to the idea. And I, I think that that speaks for a lot of fathers in this day and age. I also really liked the actors who played Simon's friends, particularly Catherine Langford, who plays a girl named Leia, who's not only Simon's friend, but also has a, a burning torch for him, which, interestingly enough, she doesn't reveal until he comes out of the closet. And this movie, I think, brilliantly demonstrates not only how hard it is for somebody with this big a secret to reveal it to people with whom he's close, but it also shows that even though we're more accepting of gay people now than we used to be, even high schoolers, there are still some negative consequences that come from it, especially when Simon accidentally reveals it to an acquaintance who blackmails him in order to get closer to a f- another friend of Simon's, not Leia, but another girlfriend by the name of Abby. So uh, th- there's there's a lot in this movie. Sometimes it feels like swallowing a cyanide pill, but that's because I really don't miss high school. It's not because I don't like this movie. It gets my rating of a knockout. It's very well acted, so unique, and a great coming out film for the high school crowd these days. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the Black Experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is an animated film called Sergeant Stubby, an American Hero. This is a movie about a stray dog who is a bull terrier or Boston terrier. I don't know what, but either way, I, I think it's probably more of a bull terrier as he's animated. But he's given the name Stubby when he gets adopted by a soldier who is training to fight in what was known back in 1917 as the Great War, but what we know today as World War I. And Sergeant Stubby is not only adopted by the soldier, but he's basically adopted by the soldier's entire regiment. Even the drill sergeant takes a liking to this cute pup, and no wonder, because when you see the dog on film, you can't help but be <laughs> enamored by him. But for Sergeant Stubby's various actions, and the reason that this dog is called Sergeant Stubby is not just because it's a cute name, but because the dog was actually promoted to a sergeant in real life. This is based on a true story, even though it's animated. And yes, the army actually did promote Stubby to sergeant. <laughs> Probably as an honorary title. I don't think that they expected this dog to uh, lead a combat mission but he did actually serve a useful purpose in world war one uh, for his valorous actions sergeant stubby is still recognized to this day as the most decorated dog in american history and yeah th th this movie did take some artistic liberties in in the telling of the, this dog plus it is a cleanly animated film it's it's cgi animated and i think that one of the weaknesses of the film is that it does make world war one and the, the battlegrounds of, of france where these american soldiers are fighting look more like a summer camp than a war zone but in any event, while I would have maybe preferred to have seen a true story like this be filmed in, well, d to be a live action film rather than an animated one, this movie still has its moments, not to mention the dog in the movie is incredibly adorable, not to mention <laughs> not to mention a, a, a real American hero. And I'm, I'm not saying that ex exaggeratingly. But the soldier who actually adopts stubby by unofficially is named robert conroy who might be a real person uh let me actually just look that up. yes robert conroy it was actually a real corporal who fought in world war one in 1917 and 1918 and in this movie he's voiced by logan lerman and logan lerman is a young actor he's only 26 years old but he's been in movies like fury and the perks of being a wallflower and he was also the titular character in both percy jackson movies that have come out so far so he's the voice of robert conroy and when the american forces joined when, when the american troops joined forces with the french troops Robert Conroy also befriends a French soldier who's very Falstaffian, whose name is Gaston Baptiste, and he's voiced by Gerard Depoidot. And meanwhile, the narrator of this film also is Robert Conroy's sister, Margaret Conroy, who we never see, so she might as well be the animator, uh, rather the narrator of this film. And she's voiced by Helena Bonham Carter. And th this movie certainly is very well animated. And actually, interestingly enough, Helena Bonham Carter is British, but she puts on an American accent to do the 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 narration in this film. It's not unwelcome, but I, I would have thought that actually when I was listening to Helena Bottom Carter narrate, I didn't actually view the credits until after I, I saw the film. I I thought it was Susan Sarandon who was who was narrating. And I thought that also, it's one thing if a British person plays an American person. That happens all the time. But when a British person puts on, America, puts on an American accent to narrate another film, I don't quite see the purpose of that. But 
in any event, Helena Bonham Carter does a good job narrating this movie, and it certainly tells a good story. It's actually quite amazing what Stubby the Bull Terrier or Boston Terrier actually does. But he did serve, this is a true story, with the 102nd Infantry Regiment in the trenches of France for 18 months and participated in four offensives, excuse me, four offensives and 17 battles. And he did things like, for instance, crawl through mustard gas and even apprehend uh, German soldiers that were too close to the American troops. If you actually look up Stubby or Sergeant Stubby on Wikipedia or even read a book about him, uh, this, this dog was actually considered a real hero of the war. And today it's actually not unusual for the armed services including in America, to work with dogs. As a matter of fact, there was a great live-action film last year starring Kate Morrow, which was called Megan Levy, which was about a Marine uh, during the Iraq and Afghanistan invasion that trained a German shepherd to fight in the war. And that movie revealed a lot of interesting tidbits about dogs who serve in the armed services they also have ptsd like humans do and that jeopardizes their chances of being raised as a civilian dog i actually found that fascinating so sergeant stubby is a movie that i think kids might like i do think that the danger of this film is being animated and having such a cute dog in it it does paint a rosier picture of world war one than probably world any war particularly deserves to be painted i think if a.a a. milne were alive today and saw this movie he would be outraged and this was the guy who created winnie the pooh but if you saw in the movie goodbye christopher robin the underrated movie from last year you would know that A.A. A. Milne, before he decided to create Winnie the Pooh to connect with his younger son, Christopher Robin Milne, B- Billy Moon Milne, he was actually in the process of writing a book denouncing war as a necessity. But in any event, Sergeant Stubby, I don't have too much time, more time to talk about this, but it gets my rating of a checkout. I do think it's a well-animated movie. I think it's a little too well done. If it were released by a more major film studio like Pixar, I think that Pixar wouldn't have been afraid to delve into more of the negative emotions that went into this. But as an animated film, Hi, I'm Danica it's Patrick. serviceable. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for this show, it's now time for me to get into my final segment of the show, which is What's Coming Up Next. This is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. Now, if you're thinking that The Avengers Infinity War is coming out this weekend... You'd be wrong. That's actually coming out next weekend. So we got another week to wait for that. In the meantime, there are a couple of smaller films that are coming out in anticipation of the Avengers movie that's probably the superhero movie to end all superhero movies. There's a lot riding on the Avengers Infinity War. And while I haven't seen any previews for it, I have seen the poster and I do know... Well, I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to talk all about that on next week's segment 
what's coming up next. But this week's segment, there are some notable films that are coming out. The first one is I Feel Pretty, which is the latest movie starring Amy Schumer. This is about a woman who struggles with insecurity and wakes from a fall, believing she is the most beautiful and capable woman on the planet. Her new confidence empowers her to live fearlessly. But what happens when she realizes her when she realizes her appearance never changed? As I said, this movie stars Amy Schumer and also co-stars Michelle Williams, Amy Ratajkowski, Busy Phillips, A.D. Bryant, and several other notable actors. Now, I feel pretty as a movie. I usually tell you guys this is a movie I will see or I probably will see, and I'll let you know what I think about it next week. This movie I actually have seen in a uh, sneak preview. I was thinking about reviewing for it for this show, but I'm going to keep with my standard of reviewing it for next week's show, and I will let you know what I think about the movie next week. But I have seen it already, but I'll keep my opinion about the film to myself until next week. But that's one of the films I will, rest assured, be reviewing for you next week. Another movie that's coming out on April 20th, 420, is Super Troopers 2, which is the sequel to, of course, the, the 2001 film. And this is a movie about a border dispute that arises between the U.S. and Canada. And the Super Troopers are tasked with establishing a highway patrol station in the disputed area. So, J. Chen... Drasekar, excuse me, let me say that name again. Again, J. Chandrasekar, I, I think that's how you pronounce it, is back to directing this movie. And J, I'm not going to go through his last name again, but uh, I, I feel bad when I can't quite pronounce people's last names, is one of the members of Super Troopers who also returns for this film, and a number of other actors from the original film, like Brian Cox and Linda Carter, return to this film as well. I'm very interested to see this film. Again, Super Troopers was a very funny movie. I did think it was slightly overrated, but I I did enjoy it. And there's a lot riding on a sequel that comes out 17 years later. Sometimes it succeeds, but also like Finding Dory, for instance. But sometimes it fails miserably, like Zoolander 2. But in any event, Super Troopers 2, for better or for worse, is a movie I will see, and I will review it for you next week. Another film that's coming out this weekend is one called Traffic, and Traffic is spelled T-R-A-F-F-I-K. Yeah, it doesn't end with a C, it ends with a K. And it is a movie about a couple off for a romantic weekend in the mountain who are accosted by a biker gang. Alone in the mountains, Bree and John must defend themselves against the gang who will stop at nothing to protect their secrets. The movie is directed by Dion Taylor and stars Paula Patton, and I believe her husband is played by Omar Epps. And other people who star in this movie include William Fitchner, Missy Pyle, and Rosalind Sanchez, amongst other people. This is a movie that looks decent. Uh, I'm still not sure why Traffic is spelled ending with a K instead of a C, but it looks interesting. So that's a movie I will probably see, and I will definitely review it for you for next week's show, unless otherwise stated. And the last movie I'm going to mention for you is one called Ghost Stories, which might be coming out in limited release. It's a movie about art skeptic professor Philip Goodman who embarks upon a terror-filled quest when he stumbles across a long-lost file containing details of three cases of inexplicable hauntings. And hauntings is in quotes. It sounds kind of interesting and it's co-directed by Andy Nyman who stars in the film along with Martin Freeman of The Hobbit and Black Panther fame. So Ghost Stories at least looks interesting and it has a very very unique poster that goes along with it. So I can't guarantee whether or not I'm going to see that film, but I'll try my best. And I will probably, if I see it, I'll review it for you next week. If not, I will move on. But that just about does it for Words on Film for this show. Just a reminder, I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. Just also as another reminder, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And until next week, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.